Okay, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us for the launch of The Intimate Resistance um, by Joseph Maria Escoron and translated by Douglas Settle. This is um, Van der Stamper's first um, essay, or essay in translation that we've published and it is a great one to start with. So Douglas will be joined tonight by Berta Sainz, who is a researcher in philosophy. And she actually did her PhD under the supervision of Joseph Maria himself. So we've got some good inside knowledge here. Um, so yes, I'm excited for what promises to be a very interesting and insightful conversation. So to kick things off, oh yes, sorry. Um, we're doing this in collaboration with Kirkdale Books. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat where you can buy The Intimate Resistance. Um, from their bookshop.org page. So if you, if you haven't got the book already, you can do so via that. Anyway, Douglas, I'm going to hand over to you and ask you to tell us a little bit about the book, um, how you came across it, and yeah, off you go. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, thank you very much, Alice, and thank you very much, Berta, and th also thank you very much to Roland from Kirkdale Books. Um, it's uh, it's really fantastic to be able to collaborate uh, with you all. So I'm very happy uh, to 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 be here to be able to talk about the intimate resistance. Um, so I'm not a philosopher, um, which made this translation probably one of the most complicated things I've ever done maybe um but also one of the most enriching things um i, I live in a place called Benedes, uh which is uh which is probably about an, an hour 45 minutes depending on how fast you you drive outside of barcelona um and i live in a little village and just up the road from this little village is another little village up in the mountains it's beautiful an absolutely beautiful um little village called san juan de mediona um, it's slightly different in its um, in its landscape in the sense that because it's sort of higher up uh, up the mountains, there's, there aren't so many vineyards. So rather, it's surrounded by um, wheat fields and um, and small sort of um, small copses of, of trees and, and and whatnot. And uh, through a friend of a friend in the region, I got to know Joseph Maria Esquirol and um was first made aware of, of of this book the intimate resistance la resistencia intima um a couple of years ago so um the reason i'm telling you this is because the i i mean i don't know for sure but i mean the place where joseph maria lives to me seems to be uh at least in part somewhat of an inspiration for not only his philosophy but but, but for this book as well, um, it's it's a small village centered on a on a church, a little sort of Romanesque church, um, and just as you go over the bridge, there are vegetable patches and vegetable gardens where neighbors share their vegetables among you know between each other. Um, and I remember going over to his house for the first time, Joseph Maria's house for the first time. Um, to talk about the book, to talk about this project. And um, I'd already read the book in, in Catalan and I was struck quite, you know, I, 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 it, was, it was, I remember being quite impacted by this, uh, by this sort of rural paradise, basically, that he was, he was surrounded by. And uh, well, we'll do the reading a little bit later, but, um, the first, the first moment, the first chapter of the book, for me, really encapsulates this this idea of um, of intimacy, basically, because it's not only intimacy um, with oneself; it's also intimacy in in the sense of um, of family, of friends, of eating together, um, and intimacy as well in 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 terms of the environment in which you live. I know. I know speaking to him about uh, possible events in the UK and things like this, that uh, 
he's not a massive fan of of traveling around um in actual fact in 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 the book in some parts of the book he sort of rails against this this idea of 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 traveling for no other reason than to take the photograph which i think is you know in in this sort of age of instagram and and you know all, all this kind of thing i think it i think it's quite quite apt um it's uh it's been a massive challenge but a, a massive challenge um i remember i remember sending over a, a very rough first draft to a friend of mine um to have a look at and he sent it back well i think <laughs> with more changes than, than there weren't it was uh it was quite a sort of uh it, it was a sign of things to come basically but i think in the end it's worked out very well worked out very well in no small way and thanks to to berta science who is here um uh who really sat down with the book and we went through it uh a, for many many hours many many hours um one of the 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 difficulties that i had with this book is the way josep maria writes um he's a philosopher um and uh so he writes about philosophy obviously but he also writes in an incredibly poetic way um and so it was very very difficult to sort of find that fine line between staying true to philosophical philosophical arguments and vocabulary and phrasing um while at the same time bringing across this poetic idea of of uh what he wanted to say um anyway sorry i'm rambling a little bit um perhaps better would you mind telling us a little bit about uh, joseph maria as as a writer as a philosopher and giving us a little bit of an idea as to as to where this book has come from so to speak sure sure yes that introduced him um first of all like thank you very much for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here today and i apologize in advance because um, i'm not english so you you will you'll see and i may have, like have some difficulties in expressing myself but i try to do it as clear as possible so um and i have also to thank uh, douglas because he invited me in the in the easiest and most fun moment of the whole translation which is the end when all the hard tough work was already done and i just had to make it beautiful and correct little things here and there so and he was very open very flexible so to me it was a great pressure he already knows so who is josep maria um well uh, i'm fortunate enough to have like a personal relationship with him he is I, i'm his student but i'm also like his friend so that allows me to give like a more personal introduction and the official one so the official the official is it is the first he is a professor in, in philosophy at the university of barcelona and he's also the director of an quite an important um research group there called apulia which is focused on contemporary philosophy and especially ethics and politics and that's already important as, as maybe we'll talk a, a bit later and he has been studying uh, mainly uh, political philosophy and contemporary philosophy and some of the authors he has devoted more attention time and, and everything to are if just in case the, some of them ring a bell to you are Hannah Arendt, um, Emmanuel Levinas, Heidegger, um, um, uh, Hassel, um, Munier, Patochka. So all those authors what they share is that they um in in the contemporary scenario they are paying attention to something that which that was very, very overlooked in the previous uh, decades and, and centuries which was everyday experience so they're saying there's something important we have to grasp in everyday experience we have to pay attention to what we're living and not only our ideas the ideas of god history progress whatever so he he shares this line with them um and then uh in the in this more personal level he is one of the few um, philosophers or teachers uh in university which make this place um a little bit warm <laughs> a little bit more human because as any big institution it's quite cold and there's a lot of uh, competition among people and you, you can imagine i think it's it's the same everywhere so i think i owe the link with university not not having given it up uh completely to him because he's one of those people that really welcome you and take care of you. 
besides being besides uh, being just a student you're also a person and you're a friend so 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 in him i find a very rare combination i think that's also in some of the values that he's trying to talk about in the book of a very like good and warm treatment but also rigor intel intellectual rigor and philosophical like um um knowledge and at the same time he has the courage of doing something that which is rare which is making his own uh, personal contribution to contemporary philosophy and that what he has been doing for the last 15 years because before he was he also published some books but his he 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 says it directly that in in the last three books three essays which are the intimate resistance the second ones the penultimate goodness they are not translated yet and the last one of this year if i'm not wrong is a uh, human more human so these three essays uh, are the place where he explained his own uh, philosophical anthropology which means from philosophy talking about human condition which is talking about our everyday experience and our challenges and our uh, and what can give meaning to our lives so in, the, among these three essays, the most famous, uh, the one which has been better like, uh, received is uh, The Intimate Resistance, and it's been translated in many languages. It has received uh, two very important awards, and very recently it's been translated to, to English, um, thanks, thanks to Douglas, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, Speaking of, of, of a sort of a personal level level of just Maria, I, I mean, I don't really know him in terms of well, I don't know him at all in terms of the university professor and and and, and things like this. Um, but as 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 a person, yeah, I mean, I agree. He's 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 a very warm person. Although I have to say that when you first meet him, he can be a little bit imposing. Um, you know, he's a very tall man, and and he sort of. Has a quite a quite a stern look on his face, but then, but then again, his philosophy comes through, and you walk into his house. He welcomes you into his house, and um, you know offers you a drink, and and then the conversation starts to flow, and it's absolutely, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, Berta, you mentioned uh, some of the philosophers um, uh, that that he's he's um, influenced by. And I have to say that in, in terms of my translation and working on the book, one of the most enriching things was, um, was sort of discovering or rediscovering some one, one or two of these uh, philosophers. I mean, there are lots of philosophers that he mentions that I didn't know about. But there are some other ones that, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I, was, I was aware of and had, had studied ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. um, is there any one philosopher that stands out in terms of his influence? yeah mm, yeah do you want me to talk about one <laughs> well or, or one or two or three i mean okay there's one mm, yeah there's one which i remember in a class he said okay i'm not going to quote him because he's in everything i say he's always there disagreeing or agreeing but he's always behind and he's called emmanuel levinas that's one of not one of the most um, famous of the ones I've said before, and and it's also true that in the Indemic resistance he appe he appears if I'm not wrong only once, so it's not very explicit, but it's an influence that, that is always always there, and I think maybe to understand him um, better, we have to talk about someone who's very much more known, which is Heidegger. Heidegger is a little bit more, yeah, appears a little bit more explicitly here in the intimate resistance. And, and there are a lot of things that um, Askirol takes from Heidegger. Um, I, I couldn't make a list because there are so many. But um, there's one which says that we don't have an authentic life if we don't assume that we are going to die. That's, that's an idea. That's not only Heidegger's, of course, but, but that's very important in Heidegger. That's what he talks about. Uh, being for death, that we are beings for, for death, basically that we become uh, mature and we lose our naivete by becoming aware that we are finite, that we, that we will die at some point and living with that truth always um, like uh, near us. And Heidegger talks about this and he talks about other things in a very lucid way and, and, and um, 
Askirol has this kind of inheritance with him. But at the same time, he makes a mistake or he forgets something important is that he doesn't talk about the other. He doesn't take the, the fellow man into account, uh, Heidegger. I think at some point in the book, maybe you'll remember better than me, but he says, uh, we'll be looking in vain for a Heidegger's ethic because there's none. And that maybe can be um, important to understand that at some point he became a Nazi. I don't know if you know about this, but there's the, the controversy with, with Heidegger is basically this, that he is an amazing, very important, crucial philosopher, but the ethics were a bit, um, uh, well, we could question his ethics a bit. And Levinas comes here, Levinas was also a Heidegger's student, and so he was a very important reference, and he was very disappointed when he became Nazi because also Levinas was a Jew, a Jew who lost most of his family in a concentration camp. And I think Levinas uh, thinks always in response and against Heidegger. And what he says is um, we have to put ethics like above thinking. So any thinking, any philosophy, any abstract theoretical discourse, which is not taken into the account the other, which is not um, taking responsibility in front of the other who is suffering and who's fragile and who's vulnerable is not going to, to lead us anywhere. And I think um, Skirol starts thinking from that base. He always he also says at some point there's a priority of action above um, thinking in the second moment or something like this when he's talking about Voltaire. So yeah, I think these two would be important names and um, authors for him. Amazing, amazing. So the intimate resistance, what is it? Um, it's resistance against what? Um, now, Berta, you have to, <laughs> you'll have to correct me if, I'm, if I go off on a tangent here. Um, but effectively, it's, it's, it's a resistance um, against the onslaught that we, that we find, uh, as, as Berta mentioned, in terms of uh, recognizing ourselves as finite beings, it's the onslaught of the modern age, it's the onslaught of, of nihilism. Um, and one of the things that I, I you know, I, I loved most about this book is, 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 is the way that Joseph Maria links this to, to the everyday and, and makes it, uh, makes the reader realize, um, that that these things have been discussed these things have been thought about um I, it, it's most certainly not a self-help book in fact joseph maria has told me on numerous occasions this is not a self-help <laughs> book you know and, and 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 in one chapter he he talks about he talks about this and he sort of he i wouldn't like to say the word attacks but he he definitely expresses his his disappointment um at 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 this sort of this 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 modern way of 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 uh, being obsessed with with being told how how to do things and and, and whatnot, but rather this is a meditation um, on the effects and the importance of 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 proximity and how it can help. Uh, well, no, I shouldn't say help, and how it can uh, how it's important. Uh, to identify our day-to-day -day lives, um, our relationships with other people. He talks an awful lot about um, the connection with other people. In actual fact, one of the most sort of difficult things, and, and uh, Berta will remember, there's this idea of juntura, ne juntamen. So junta is basically in Catalan is to sort of connect, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember just Maria talking to me very passionately about this idea of how the ajuntamen, which is which is literally which it's, it's, it means town hall or, uh, in, in 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 Catalan, comes from this this idea of connecting people together, um, ajuntura uh, of of people. So it's not just a case of having a town hall, uh, a, a, a legal and fiscal body in in the centre of town, removed from 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 the people but rather it's 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 a meeting point it's a connection um of 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 people and houses that, that bring them to that bring them together he also talks about verticality um which again was you know you can imagine it's quite difficult to sort of translate these things uh, well no it's it, i mean verticalidad becomes vertic verticality relative, relatively simply but of course the 
there are sort of issues with that. And this brings me back to the difficulties in terms of translating it, um, because there are certain specific uh, phrases for a certain specific uh, vocabulary that, um, that, just, that Joseph Maria insisted on. Another one would be um, cosmicity which just doesn't actually appear in the dictionary. But it's, and and, and I, I brought the translation to him. We were going through it. And I said, I've got a big question about this word here, cosmicity. And he goes, oh, perfect. I've, inven I've invented that. <laughs> oh, oh, brilliant. OK, well, there you go. Um, and so, you know, this idea of verticality and um, again, there are certain there are certain aspects of it which make it very, very difficult to translate into into English because he, he refers to the human as as uh, as a vertical object, a vertical sort of stick against the the, the horizon of, of existence, and we resist this this sort of falling down, which of course represents our death. Um, but then he sort of turns it around and he says, well, you know, it we we represent an I, which of course an I in Catalan means and. And so this representation of the human as an and brings it back to what Berta said before about it's all about the other. It's all about this connection between people. And um, quite wonderfully, he, he, he brings about this idea of, of being able to resist this, this, uh, this inevitable, uh, well, inevitable death, effectively, really, uh, and disappearance and disintegration of the person through, through the everyday. Um, and I just think it's 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 an absolutely beautiful book, uh, and it's incredibly well written. And all I can do is hope that uh, that I've done it justice. Um, but what do you think? Should we should we read uh, a, little, a little? Well, shall I read an extract? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So one of the extracts that we've chosen is is actually the first few pages of of, of the book. It's a moment. So. Um, sort of wedged between um, the main chapters, uh, Jose Maria has, has introduces these things called moments, which are more sort of poetic phil philosophical um, notions on, on what he's actually talking about in, in the other chapters. It's, it's worth mentioning, actually, that when I spoke to him, um, he said that he is constantly arguing his point, constantly. There is no, there is no moment when he, he's writing simply for writing's sake. Every single thing uh, is important, which of course made me feel a lot more, <laughs> a lot less calm and comfortable, but I thought, oh goodness me, so I get a word wrong here and it all goes, goes to pot. But anyway, um, so this word, this first moment, which is called the warm plate on the table, and I just think it's absolutely beautiful. And again, it, it really brings it back to, to what I was saying before about where he lives his you know his, his surroundings because you look out of his window or you go out onto his little sort of balcony and there, there are some old stone arches and you look across the uh, the vegetable patch and then there's a there's there's a uh, a very picturesque little church there and then it goes and then and then the hill goes up and it's just uh, there's wheat in the in the fields and uh, it's just glorious up there it's absolutely wonderful anyway sorry so um <clears throat> the warm plate on the table a moment um the plate on the table the olive oil and bread the table laid the pot simmering and the glasses half steamed up by the vapor rising from the stew what removes this everyday image so far from the nihilistic experience what if it fails to comply with scenes of the void and the absurd what do we associate with it? Where does it take us? The warm plate on the table, full of something that is cooked or was once cooked at home. Nothing sybaritic, nothing sophisticated. More than anything, we associate it with the care for others that the act of cooking represents, company and the shelter of home. Also, of course, the pleasure of eating and our memory of the constituent parts. The olive oil we drizzle over our food brings to mind the olive tree and the firm earth into which it sinks its roots. The bright sky overhead, the mature fruit, the harvest, the press. Bread, too, reminds us of the earth and the heavens, vast fields of wheat at the edge of the blue. Yet it also bears us away to something even more primordial, others. 
Bread is something to be shared and our companions come with together and pan bread are literally those with whom we share it. Sitting around the table, our fellow diners both create and are community. The warm plate on the table conjures up images of Bartleby, Melville's literary hero and marginal personality who today is still evoked by t-shirts and other products bearing the unsettling phrase, I would prefer not to. Bartleby never had a place at table, at least based on rather overwhelming evidence. This was the suspicion of the lawyer who employed him. Nobody prepared and served Bartleby his lunch, not even an anonymous chef in some local restaurant, nor did he ever break bread with anyone. He ate alone, hidden away in his office. So perhaps it's not totally surprising that Bartleby eventually died of voluntary starvation. Well, his body died, but his spirit flounders and fails as a result of something quite different. We renew our lives together and our delight in food and drink takes on a spiritual dimension as we sit together around the table, sharing words and gestures. Collective life depends on the act of eating together. It's precisely due to this that images of isolation, not solitude, are so unsettling. The bread and salt, the feast, grief and peace, community and living together, however difficult and uncertain, depends on sharing these things. Um, and so from this opening, this opening moment, this opening sort of semi-chapter, so to speak, Joseph Maria is already laying out um, his argument uh, for the book. And as Berta said, um, this idea of building on, on Heidegger's beliefs in terms of being man towards death. Um, but, un, you know, but, but underlying it with, um, with Levinas's um, ethical, ethical uh, beliefs and things like this. Um, I love this. I love this opening. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, and again, if you can sort of picture in, in, in your mind, I, I can almost picture Joseph Maria sitting in his office, looking out of the window and seeing the lone olive tree or the collection of olive trees nestled in to the, uh, the swaying wheat and uh, him, writing, him writing this while downstairs a dinner is being prepared or, or, or friends and family are arriving ready to, to share bread, to break bread around the table um, this book has has taught me a lot I think not just about about Sartre and Camus and and Nietzsche and, and all these people and Heidegger of course um, but it's also changed a lot about how I how much I value um, these things and I think um, yeah I, and I think it's a very important I think it's a very important book um, but the, how, how does this, just this very short part, how does it reflect his philosophy uh, on a more sort of technical base level rather than me <laughs> banging on about this? Well, I think everyone who has read The Intimate Resistance remembers that part. It's very iconic. And it's quite striking because I don't know if you've read other philosophical essays, but no philosophical essays start with this. Like, it doesn't seem like a philosophical scenario. And he knows that because that kind of image is so common, so obvious, so shared. It's not, um, it's not unsettling. It's not suspicious. There's nothing weird. So everything's normal. Okay, fine. It's like, it's, that's every day. And so what he's saying, he's giving the message from the very beginning that this is the philosophical, uh, this is this, the philosophical subject we should be concerned uh, about. So he's saying there's something important we are missing out on because we are not able to pay attention to it, which is the importance of sharing a meal. And I remember he there's somewhere else, like at the beginning, at the end of the of the book, actually, when he's gathering everything he's been working on and reflecting on, he says we have to look at what is superficial with a deep gaze. So trying to press what is deep and meaningful in what seems superficial. And what seems superficial are that, these kind of experiences which are shared by everyone. So it, it, he also says, um, what I'm talking about, this kind of um, philosophical anthropology is very democratic because it's, um, everyone can, can do it. I mean, everyone shares meals, everyone has a home, everyone has friends. 
um, so everyone can reflect on this kind of experience, which is a resistance to nihilism, a, a resistance to, um, we'll, we'll talk about nihilism a, bit, a, bit, a little bit later maybe, but to this uh, feeling of losing everything, every reference, because these kind of things are what, what can keep us um, connected with others and not completely deorientated. Uh, yeah, and, and on the other hand, then these moments, I, I found them very useful because there are three moments in the, in the intimate resistance and they, they are used as pauses or their are moments, they're pauses or par parentheses, is it how it's called, um, in the middle of that more theoretical, which is not that theoretical, but more uh, clear explanation um, of, of the essay. And what they're doing, as you said, is uh, conveying a more intuitive uh, message, which makes use of literature and, and poetry in the middle of philosophy too. Which is an important, which is um, a very interesting collaboration. He's not the first in doing it, but he is like doing it every time. There are a lot of references and quotes which are not from thinkers or philosophers, but from of like um, writers or poets, because he he wants also to keep this philosophy meaningful and touching and accessible for everyone. And he's also trying to get to grasp what is meaningful in all these uh, cultural expressions, not only in philosophy. So he's also giving like a, a kind of a message to philosophers, mostly saying, I think you've lost a little bit in, in you're, you're lost in academics and in your theoretical discussions and you're missing what's more important and you're not talking to people. So moments are a way of talking to people directly and also of, a di of making a division in the, in the text, in the, all the journey he's inviting us to do. But I think we won't talk about this because it's really it's a big spoiler of the of the whole intimate resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, you, you mentioned another another reading, uh, another extract that we might be able to look at. Yeah, um, could, yeah maybe we could talk about. Um, I don't know because I I like them a lot. Uh, Nietzsche's is one, but maybe. Um, Oh, that's an option, but then the other one is the about the medical gesture, which is very beautiful too. That's one of them. Um, let's should we, should we do the medical gesture one, Great. and then we can talk about Camus a little bit. Sure. Uh, let me just. Which page is it? Um, oh yeah, seventy-six, seventy-seven. Yeah. So. Yeah. So Jose Maria, he also talks about. Um, Albert Camus. Now it's quite funny. It's quite funny actually. Uh, as, as part of this sort of this whole process of translating this book, um, I, all, I all of a sudden found myself reading all sorts of philosophical texts. I read Sartre, I read Camus. I tried to read Heidegger. I gave up. Um, uh, who else did I read? I can't remember now. Uh, Wittgenstein, people like this. Anyway, and so then I would go around to his house for our weekly meeting and I would say, just Maria, I've read Sartre. I've read it. It's wonderful. And he would say, don't read Sartre. Read me. <laughs> and I would say, well, yes, but, you know, I'm kind of doing it to sort of get a background. He says, well, OK, fine, good. But, uh, you know, be careful. Anyway, um, so, yeah, so there's, a, there's an excerpt here. Um, page 76. Yeah. Um, where he talks about Camus, and in actual fact, he, he, he refers a lot to, to Camus' The Plague, um, which, is, which is a story where it is based in North Africa, I think, isn't it? And there's yeah. a plague which comes down and um, or comes along, and lots of people die, and, it, and he uses it to sort of, to sort of uh, identify the importance of, of the nurse and the doctor um as as this connection between people right all right cool so the doctor is the nurse the nurse is the doctor illness or injury makes us weaker feebler uh, at times not able to stand this common experience is what leads to the meaning of the word nurse coming from middle english nurtion nourishen to supply with food and drink, feed, bring up, nurture. And you can imagine the fun I had with that, because obviously he didn't use English, he used uh, Catalan, but it's all part of, part of it, it's good fun. 
um, a nurse is dedicated to bringing up, to helping the infirm stand up again. Uh, as we all know, in order to be strong, we need to eat. It is no, in no way a coincidence that the most common question in situations of illness is the ever typical, is he, she eating? Food nourishes both the body and the spirit and is a source of strength, as such that our word nurse should come from the Latin nutrire, or nourish, speaks volumes. The nurse is a person who, so as to make them stronger, cares for and nourishes, and if needs be, feeds those who for some reason find themselves frail, weak, and bedbound. Indeed, the root for the word clinic is related to the word, to, sorry, to the Greek for bed and to lie. The nurse is on vigil, like a guard on watch. It is, significant, it is significant that in this field, one of the most emblematic references is Florence Nightingale, a 19th century British nurse known as the Lady of the Lamp, due to the fact that she would go around the hospital beds every night with a lamp in her hand to see if any of the poor prostrated patients needed anything. Just the lone light of the lamp or candle helped to distance the sick from the anxieties and fears of the night. And the gently whispered, good night, has the same effect as the lamp. It illuminates and calms. Um, so, Jose Maria talks a lot about, about the importance of, of, of the nurse and the doctor uh, in, in, in his philosophy. Uh, but could you, could you tell us a little bit? Because I've just seen that a, there's a question is there any Sartre or, or Camus in, in Jose Maria Esquidol? Would you be able to sort of um, give a little bit of background to, to Camus' role in, in the philosophy? And, and I mean, obviously, I, I've mentioned that, that the book, The Plague, is, is, is mentioned quite a lot. Um, yeah. Um, well, it has to do with, with what we were saying before that uh, he uses literature a lot and, and he uses like shared cultural um, uh, works which are known by people who are not experts or not thick uh, in philosophy. And, and the plague would be one of them, one, one of these examples. Um, he, I, I understand that he said, don't read him, read me, because he is really using a very personal, like he's using them in a very specific way. And he, what he's saying to do is he has um, cherry picked two uh, uh, characters of the plague. I don't know if you remember, there's one Dr. Uh, Rio and the second one, Taru like these two um, characters because in different ways one being a doctor and the other one not being a doctor at all through that experience of the plague which is uh, one of those nihilist experience where our mortality our vulnerability our fragility becomes more obvious um, and, and when where the need the others have of our help is so like there is so visible uh, so there's in those moments, there's something which is especially revealing, which is the importance of taking care of the others. And so these two chapters do this thing from different uh, from different positions. One is directly like they're trying to help the other, heal the people who are who are ill, and the other one is uh, trying to help the ones who are helping. They, he's like more supporting, but he is having. He says they are, they are really like moved by the same spirit and the same insight which is that caring is the best thing they can do in front of fragility. And a fragility which is not of the ill, but it's shared. I could become ill at any moment. And the, other, the only thing that would give me a life and that would, uh, yes, like the, that would help me would be the care of others because we are not independent and self-sufficient, self-made men and, and women. That's, that's what he's trying to, to make us um, be aware of. Um, so that's, I think that's why he's using this, this book, but I, I think I, he could be using many others. Mm -hmm. Sartre, on the other hand, plays a, a more like specific um, role at the beginning where he's talking about existing as resisting. And he says, maybe it's, it sounds very different from Sartre's existing as projecting yourself, as uh, um, choosing what you want to be, because you don't have like an essence which comes from you or which God gave you that you have to decide and you cannot escape your freedom. That's what he's saying at the beginning. So he says, existing as resisting is pretty much um, in relation and in, um, in accordance with that idea. It's just another angle because you cannot be free without resisting the difficulties of life. Um, so I think that's it. 
I, I also remember in, in, in the book, he, he refers to Sartre's nausea. Yeah. Um, the book. And I think um, the character Rocatin or someone, someone like this, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, um, he, says, he says that in, in Sartre's book, he, it, it, it says, I am alone, completely alone, or something like this. And I, I talk to no one, I see no one. Yeah. But Jose Maria says that, that this, this is not resistance. This, this, this is not the way to resist in terms of his philosophy. Yeah. Because while this character in Sartre is, is resisting, so to speak, but he's resisting in, a, in an unhealthy way, perhaps. Would mm. that be right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, now I was remembering, yeah. He's, at that moment, he's talking uh, a lot about the nihilist experience, and he's talking about different ways of dealing with it, of getting out of it, get, getting out of it. One is Nietzsche, which he thinks it's not right. It's that idea of the ubermens, the superman who goes only, who only cares about his own desires, impulses, and he follows it, his will of power in a very creative, crea creative way. The other one would be this, what you, what you were mentioning, which is more um, surrendering to that that um, that feeling of not having any reference completely. So it, that's absolutely giving up hope. And that's what this, um, this character is doing in that case. And he, what he says um, makes us, well, enables us to get out of nihilism is finding some link, some link with the other. Actually, it's a very beautiful discussion because he uses a lot of etymology because he really relies on common language. He says, common language has a lot of wisdom like that, that common people gathered and stored in their language. That's why we, he doesn't want to be very, um, like using specific um, terminology. He wants to use common language because he, he thinks that there's wisdom there. So um, when he talks about nihilism, uh, he, he says nihilism comes from nihilum, which means no threat. Is it meaning you, you've lost any link and when you finally, when you find someone who can take you out of it, then you can resume everyday life, not being naive, so being aware of the fragility of things, taking care of them because they, you, you know you cannot take them from granted, you know they will end at some point, but at, but at least not, not losing completely yourself, like finding some provisional temporary, temporary references which can help. And he says the other is one of these. So very personal relationships are one of these threats which can kind of save you. Mm. I noticed that he, I mean, he, he uses etymology a lot to make these, to make these arguments. And uh, it's something that I really, really enjoyed uh, <laughs> when reading it and when translating it. There's, I, I, I was just looking for it just now that, that there's one very, very short little thing uh, that starts at the bottom of page 21. Uh, he says uh, in Spanish, nada, nothing comes from the latin nulla res nata meaning no born thing um, the fact that the evolution of the words has led to in this case just the word nata representing the entirety of the original idea leads us to ask ourselves whether the truth is that everything born carries within it a nothingness that then consumes it over time from the first day to the last Interestingly, the Spanish nada doesn't require the Catalan negation of no res or the English no, well, nothing, no thing, or the Italian niente, etc. As if everything that has been born is already nothing, as if the wood from which the carcass of the world is made were from the very beginning prey to the woodworm of nothingness. <laughs> I, remember, I, remember, I remember translating that, well, reading it and then translating it and then coming downstairs and and, and mentioning it to my to my partner, and uh, I thought I think she I can't remember what I, I, yeah I think she thought oh goodness me what's he what's he doing now <laughs> anyway um, yeah no wonderful wonderful do you think we have time for, Alice do you think we have time for one more reading or should we move on to the questions um, we've just got one more question in the chat so I think we have time for for another reading as well a short one yeah. Okay, cool. Arthur, you mentioned uh, it's page 25, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 20, let, me, let me check. Because you've got, you, you, we, we, well, you sent me two here. Uh, which one would be better? I sent you two. Um, well, maybe I think it's 
Ran is the second one, but I we've already explained it a little bit, but just to see how he is. Maybe I can introduce it at the beginning and then we don't have to comment on it because we've already been saying things in relationship with this, but he's um, trying to show that the, he agrees with Nietzsche in his uh, diagnosis that um, we cannot rely on absolute non impersonal truths, like things that can, uh, without experience, um, be the like definite, uh, definitive um, word for everyone. So saying there is a God and that that's a solution for everything. There's, this is the truth. There's one way of conceiving the human being, one way of, um, of, con of building community or society and that's it. So if you say this kind of easy universal solutions, like we don't believe them any, in, and we don't believe in them anymore. So that's what he's saying. That's what Nietzsche said in a more cultural way. And he says, we have to undergo that process personally too, to have this impression of losing every, every reference. And he says, um, Nietzsche goes to that summit of philosophy and says, there is no universal truth which can stand um, this, uh, this uh, process that I've been undergoing. Uh, but then, as, and Askirol would be there too. But they would then take different paths. They would reach different conclusions as they create creative, positive moment after this uh, nihilistic crisis. And so he says. <laughs> um, perfect. Uh, shall, 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 shall I read a, a, a part or? Yes. This is to say. See. Uh, I can't find that. Which, which page is it? That's 27. This is to say. Is it like at the end? This is to say Nietzsche. Ah, okay. That is to say, Nietzsche tries to return and invert that alienation of life back into thought, though he does so in a very peculiar way. Where could he have gone after having scaled the mountain? Well, we know that having scaled the highest peaks, there is nothing quite like going back home to the refuge. What if one has no home or refuge? Having been up there at the top, the cold creeping into the very core of his bones, his face slashed at by the freezing wind like wave after wave of steel blades, and afterwards, no shelter, no warm welcome. At the very most, a cheap imitation. Too much isolation, too many changes, bad health and aches and pains, and problems with his mother and sister, who, according to him, were the only serious objections to his thesis of eternal recurrence. Um, the philosophy of proximity is also an answer to nihilism, though it is very different to the Nietzschean one. It aims to reset nihilism by moving closer to finitude. Instead of eternal recurrence, there is returning home. Nietzsche might say that there is nothing but a vulgar replica of the very worst of Christianity, but this is the pounding that requires resisting. Instead of the will to power, resistance. Instead of the superman, proximity. Instead of assertion, assertion the problem problematicity. Instead of the future, memory. So I think he summed it up rather nicely there. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a question from Peter in the chat for you, Doug. Could you mm. say some more about tra translating nurse, etc.? Um, and did you also introduce Florence Nightingale in your translation? Ah, well, the Florence Nightingale was in the original already. Mm. He he mentioned Florence Nightingale, so that was that was a relief. Uh, I didn't have to do anything like that. Um, in terms of nurse, I mean. Um, for those of you who, who, who don't know, nursing cattle is infermera, um, which, which is, et, you know, etymologically, etymolog etymologically speaking, is, 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 is great, really. It, 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 it's, it's, it's linked to this idea of infirm. Uh, it's linked to, I mean, perhaps Berta could help us a little bit more about this in terms of the etymolo etymology of, of infermera. Um, and so Joseph Maria played a lot with that, this idea of, of you know, infermera, looking after the infirm, um, helping them stand up again, uh, and these kind of things. Um, so when I decided to, to use nurse, it, very, it became very, very obvious very quickly that I needed to, to somehow sort of draw it from a completely different um, route, so to speak back to back to what Josemaria was 
was talking about. And fortunately, one of the things that I found about, about this, I, I discovered, uh, well, I, I, I discovered lots of things uh, in terms of etymology is that while the languages often come, come from different, different sort of roots, so to speak, obviously in general, all languages go back to the, the original root, but um, so Catalan obviously comes from Latin, uh, etc. English uh, is a Germanic language, although it has an awful lot of of, of Latin um, influence. Um, they all go back to the same sort of thing. You know, nurse comes from to nourish um, in terms of, you know, providing food, providing help and things like this. Um, and that, that, again, that was a very enriching sort of sort of idea. I, me I remember having going back to what I was talking about before about la, la Juntamen, this this collection of, of 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 houses, this collection of people. I remember having an awful sort of trouble um, getting getting my head around this translation of this of this word. And it, although it doesn't actually appear in the book, but I, I started looking at the etymology of town hall and therefore hall. And uh, if I remember correctly. It comes from Hial, which is H-E-A-L-L, -L, which is a sort of a proto-Germanic Germanic word, which basically means to cover and to protect. And so whilst we come from different, different, um, different sides, so to speak, it effectively comes back to the same thing, which is rather lovely, really, in, in terms of, you know, sort of the humanity of, of our language. Um, so yeah, it was fun. It was it was really fun. It was fun, but it was difficult. Yeah, I bet those aspects of the translation were, like you said, difficult. But it sounds really really interesting. So you're an etymology expert now, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, uh, yeah. Well, no, not at all. I, I discovered a good etymology website, basically, <laughs> uh, which uh, which helped me which helped me an awful awful lot. So that was. Uh, that was great, but I mean, yeah, the book the book itself is, is an absolute treasure trove of of ideas, thoughts, um, and it was an absolute pleasure to to translate. Um, and again, I'd like to thank Berta for for helping um, an awful lot uh, okay. with the translation. I, I went through the first couple of drafts, and then and then we sat down, um, and Berta really turned what I think was a satisfactory translation into something which is a whole lot better so thank you very much i have to thank him because he was very generous he was very flexible i think what we what we were doing was difficult we, had, we, we you gave me the role of you say it beautifully you said um keeping the translation loyal to the to the original version which was uh, an honor <laughs> which is a lot of fun if you've read it many times as i as i did with this book um, and and that was so so beautiful, so enriching, just to make it like and to, to be talking about philosophy with you and about language because it's something that we both love. So yeah. so it, it was it was a lot of fun, and you were really like open to someone stepping in at the last moment and and making changes. So mm -hmm. so I have to thank you. No no <laughs> but, no 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 I mean, no, no I, the, I have to thank you <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would, sorry Bertha, yeah. No, I, I just, I, in, in case uh, there's someone who has not read this translation, I would really like encourage people to do so because it's, it's uh, there are a lot of layers of, re of possible uh, readings in the, in the book. Maybe here, I think talking to about the most philosophical background, but there's no need of having it for enjoying the book. And so you can always go back to that book and discover different messages which are there hidden but i think it can be like i i, I shared with my with my parents i mean and, and they have nothing to do with philosophy that, but they could also feel somehow close to what Jude maria was saying there so i would really encourage recommend reading it yeah definitely as we said before we started the the event i have absolutely no background in philosophy very minimal knowledge but i still really enjoyed it so yeah that's true <laughs> Doug, there's one more question about the etymology vocabulary from Ron. Um, mm. Did your old English help too, he says? <laughs> <laughs> um, my old English, my poor old English. Um, <laughs> well, not, not really. There, there were examples of where it might have 
come in handy were very few and far between more as I, as you know as, as we mentioned the sort of the etymology of of these things um who knows Sub, subconsciously it might have helped a little bit yeah um but uh not not actively perhaps i don't know <laughs> Wonderful. So if there's no more questions in the in the chat, we can tie it up there. So thank you, first of all, to Kirkdale Bookshop for collaborating with us. There's still the link in the chat if you can buy, you can go and buy the book from their bookshop.org page. And I put their website in the chat as well. So finally, thank you to Doug and Berta for that really fascinating conversation about the book. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. <laughs> everyone, have a good evening. Bye. You too. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>